Elliot Ackerman, and I am joined today by Joby Warwick to discuss his new book, Redline. And we are hosted by the St. Louis County Library. And for those of you who are of interest, book sales today can be done through our sponsor, which is Left Bank Books. So Joby, it is great to have you with us today, and uh, congratulations on Redline. Thanks so much, and thanks for doing this. And I also have to congratulate you. You've got a new book coming out in two weeks. I think it sounds amazing. It's a speculative novel called 2034 about a future war, and you've written it with uh, former Admiral Je uh, James Stravitas. So congratulations on that. I hope it does quite well. Thanks, Joby. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, For those of you who don't know, I think Joby and I are a nice pairing. Both of us have uh, written about conflict. Both of us have uh, covered the wars in Iraq and Syria. I first came to Joby's work when I read his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Black Flags, which is all about Zaman Zarqawi, who is the founder and leader of the Islamic State in Iraq. Uh, I myself am a military veteran and fought in the Iraq war. And uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about Redline is that you use chemical weapons and how the West and the international community responded to the chemical weapons that were used in the Syrian civil war to really outline for the reader the contours of the Syrian civil war, which admittedly is an incredibly complex conflict. How did you land on this subject coming off of Black Flags? Yeah, well, thank you for those kind words and thank you for taking up what I was really trying to do, which is to, to try to explain Syria to Americans in particular. And I must say, most of us tune out. It's such a horrific conflict. Uh, it's so confusing. It's hard to know what to think. And so most of us, frankly, tune out. And, and yet there's an important story for Americans there. And I was able to use the device of the chemical weapons story, both as a kind of a, a narrative thread, a backbone for the book, something for, for readers to follow. But this is also the one issue that America and the world really decided to, to grapple with. We were concerned about the humanitarian suffering and the refugees and everything else. There was seemingly so little we could do about that, but this is the one battleground we decided to join, to try to do something about this horrific chemical weapons attack that happened in 2013 and the subsequent attacks using diplomacy, perhaps military power, figure out some way to confront and hopefully change the conflict. And we succeeded in a small way, we managed to get most of the weapons out, but the bigger picture is, is absolute failure because uh, it is this uh, human humanitarian crisis now in its 10th year. Uh, the suffering is almost unimaginable and the geopolitical impact around the region, around the world it is still with us. And it's given us everything from uh, these massive destabilizing refugee flows, this great center of instability in the Middle East, uh, massive flows of foreign fighters from all over the world to join this conflict, the resurgence of ISIS and other groups that are nearly as bad. So all this comes out of Syria. So it is important for us to understand how this started, you know, how it all uh, came to be as it is, and how our own efforts to try to change and, and influence the outcome uh, were ultimately unsuccessful. And that's all hopefully contained within this volume. Those are all enormous ideas. And I know as a writer, it's tough to take the very general and make it specific. And so I loved how the book opened with Iman. Can you talk about him? So when the chemical weapons attacks happened in 2013, it turns out we have a pretty good idea of what Syria has and where it is and, and the kind of damage that it can possibly do because we had a secret spy inside uh, Syria's uh, chemical weapons program, a scientist working in the lab. And just through the course of my reporting and just interviews with former intelligence people and with others on the periphery of the story, I kept hearing about this exquisite information we had from inside Syria. How do we have it? How do we know so much? And it turns out it's because we had a, the best possible spy that anyone could have inside Syria working as a scientist inside their labs. And we ran in for more than 14 years. He was in the main lab where sarin was made. And he managed to send us an incredible wealth of secrets about the program, including, in one case, an actual sample of some of the goods. He sent us some sarin for us to analyze. Because of this, when the hostilities take place, we realize not only what Syria has, but we realize the potential importance and how dangerous the situation was if some of the stuff got out of control. The thing that I've really admired in the book, too, and why I wanted to open with 
Iman is I feel like he kind of haunts the entire book. Like you don't see him that much, um, but specifically I might be mismatching because is it hexamine is, yeah. the, is the chemical trace that is very specific to the type of serin, serin nerve agent that the serins produce. So it becomes almost like uh, this forensic story about trying to nail down uh, like, like a crime thriller, you know, where is this stuff coming from? Because when we start to see the chemicals used in the Syrian civil war, as you lay out in the book, you know, there are lots of questions about, you know, who's done this? Is it Assad? And there, you know, and if you think about it, those are real questions because we as Americans, I mean, lest anyone forget, just came off a massive war in Iraq in 2003 that was launched on the pretext of trying to root out chemical weapons. And so there's this resistance to do that again, but people are trying to connect us to really prove it's Assad uh, who's doing that. It comes down to, the, to, to hexamine. But can you talk a little bit about the, the controversy when we start to see the chemical weapons appearing uh, as to trying to really identify and nail down who is doing it? Several countries have made sarin. We made sarin once upon a time during the Cold War. Others have as well. But this, the Syrian government had a, a unique formula, unlike any other made. And it turns out that this spy introduced us to that. It was this additive called hexamine that nobody else uses anywhere in the world. And so when that kind of unique signature starts to show up in different attacks, the early ones before the, the big one in 2013 that just killed a handful of people, the sort of massive attack in 2013, and later on, uh, years later in 2018 or 17, still another attack, hexamine becomes part of the, you know, the, the fingerprint of this particular kind of, of sarin and allows us to connect it not just with the Syrian government, but with their very early program. This is what they've been making all along. The thing that has like struck me in my own work, in my own life, being around the wars in Iraq, and I lived in Istanbul for many years during the Syrian civil war and was covering that, is that these, you know, how deeply interconnected these conflicts are. I, I view them as one contiguous conflict, the war in Iraq into the war in Syria in many ways, how they, how they, how they bled over. I'm hoping you could talk about how significant that attack was in August of 2013 and how so much of what became America's policy towards Syria and the way the war went in the future stems out of that month and that response. So could you talk about that a little bit? There are these ebbs and flows in this civil war with the rebels seemingly gaining the upper hand in 2012. And it really looks like Assad's days are numbered and everybody thought so. The Americans, the Israelis, everybody in the intelligence world just assumed that Assad was going to collapse. By 2013, not so much. He's starting to, to dig in. Hezbollah, Iran are starting to back him in a major way. Russia is making clear that they're in the game as well. So there are lots of uh, resources that are coming Assad's way to allow him to hang on to territory. And yet Syria is losing some of the hinterlands and losing some of the peripheral cities. And they make a, a tactical decision to start using their one of their great strategic assets, chemical weapons. And they do it at first in small ways, little attacks here and there, sometimes just killing one or two people. And then suddenly in 2013, you have this massive attack. It's that kills by US estimates about 1400 people, nearly all civilian, most of them women and children. It takes place in the wee hours of a single morning in 2013. It's an attack that my reporting suggests that was way worse than the Syrians imagined it would be, much more de devastating, much more uh, uh, harmful in terms of casualties. But it was this pivot point in the war where, where now suddenly the West has to do something. It's the biggest chemical weapon attack that's, that's taken place since the 1980s with Saddam Hussein. It's this huge violation of this century old taboo against the use of chemical weapons. We have to do something about it. And so for, for us, it's a turning point. For the rebels, it's this moment of hope because they're saying uh, this is, aha, horrible situation here, but now the United States has to do something. Now the West has to get involved. It's going to be like Libya with the Air Force and, and you know, airstrikes, and, and this is going to be a turning point. But it wasn't that. So in, in a sense, our response to, to the chemical tax sort of crushes the hope of, of the Assad opposition. And it never really comes back after that. You see this cynicism uh, come in, you see more people turning to groups like ISIS and al-Nusra, thinking that the West is, is, is not gonna help at all. And they're, they're probably right about that. There's no way that the United States would have gotten involved militarily in the way that they wanted us to. But this really becomes 
a, a moment when the entire history of the war turns. And that's why I wanted to, to really drill in on that one incident. So contemporaneously with Assad starting to dispense his chemical arsenal in 2013 and kind of pushing the limits, we've set up this policy, the Obama administration has set up this policy of there's a red line, which is yep. the use of chemical weapons. Can you kind of talk about how that also features into, you know, whether or not we do or do not intervene? One of the few things that I think people really remember about the Obama administration and foreign policy is, is this red line statement. And it's seen as this uh, huge blunder on Obama's part. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. The, the origins, and I get to, into this fairly deeply in the book, it was, was an actual intelligence discovery in 2012 that upset folks who, who, not just in our country, but Israelis and others in the region, the possibility that Syria was going to give some of its weapons away to others for safekeeping, particularly Hezbollah, which is this militant group in Lebanon, sworn enemy of the Israelis. They have thousands of rockets pointed at Israel. What if Assad gives chemical weapons to Hezbollah and they use them in a future war? So this is a hair on fire moment that takes place in 2012. And so the, the Obama administration rightly sees this as an emergency and they go around doing several things. They warn the Syrians, they warn the Iranians, you know, call your boys off, don't let them do this. They tell the Russians, you have to restrain your friends, don't let them do anything with these chemical weapons. And then Obama walks out several times to repeat that warning. And he typically does it in a more of a diplomatic, nuanced way, saying, you know, don't go there, Syria, kind of vague, but a, a firm warning. And then at one press conference in 2012, Obama is asked about his policy and then Answering the question, he uses the line, red line. This is going to be a red line for me. And it wasn't scripted. It wasn't really a change of policy, but this is, becomes the thing that hangs around the administration's neck for the rest of the war, that you've threatened a red line, which means, as far as everybody's concerned, a military response. And so when that big attack happens in 2013, all, all our eyes turn to Obama to, to do what he said he's going to do, which is to enforce this red line, to use military force to punish Assad. And for the rebels who are listening to this, they're seeing it as America's now going to come to our side. So all this, all these expectations and all these hopes are pinned upon a single phrase that's essentially a throwaway line at a news conference, but it sticks and it becomes... But he know, says it more than times, doesn't he? He says it just the red line itself, that phrase he only uses once, but he repeats mm -hmm. the warning four different times. And mm -hmm. interestingly, Hillary Clinton does as well. So it's, it's official U.S. policy that Assad, don't use chemical weapons, don't give them away. But it, after the, the use of the term red line, it becomes much more specific than that. One of the experiences that I, I had had that was always very disoriented to me, and I hope you'll excuse me, this is less a question, more of a statement, is uh, I, you know, I lived in the, I was living in the Middle East covering this war as an Iraq war veteran. And so my Syrian friends knew I was an Iraq war veteran. And so there was this just sort of cognitive dissonance when they would look at me, and many of them had been, you know, had been activists and were very sympathetic to the rebels. And it was, it was this idea of America will invade Iraq on these very tenuous pretenses. Mm -hmm. And in Syria, you have this extremely flagrant use of chemical weapons and you will do nothing. And they, they couldn't get their mind around that. Yeah. And the, so much of the tragedy that has been watching Syria play out is because it's post-Iraq war and the, just the, I'll use this word, I think it's appropriate, the trauma of the Iraq war for all Americans, there's no, there's zero political will to do anything at home. And I, as an American abroad, very much knew this and would look to my Syrian friends and be like, I know, but you guys don't understand. If you came to America, you would understand. But, you know, it, there's just, we won't do anything. And, it, and we had, I just had many, many conversations about this. And what I thought was fascinating too is, so we have the attack in, in Gauta that you write about in the book. And Obama has made these red line statements. And then there is a moment when it does seem like the US will launch cruise missiles. And maybe you can talk about, we can remind people who are listening, what Obama kind of does legislatively, his strategy in August, and sort of the um, the twist at the end with the Russians, which kind of then launches out the, the, the second part of the book. Yeah, it, from a dramatic storytelling point of view, it's 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 quite fascinating what yeah. happened because it was this was a scramble 
you know, by the Obama administration to figure out what to do. And the impulse almost to a person in Obama's cabinet was, okay, huge violation of the red line, huge violation of the chemical weapons taboo. We're going to do a military strike. Obama wanted to do it. He was horrified by the images he saw, you know, Samantha Power, his newly appointed UN ambassador, defense folks, everybody was, yeah, we got to do this. But as you noted just now, there's a complication with, with American foreign policy when it comes to weapons of mass destruction. We've right. gotten to a war before on false evidence. And so one thing Obama wanted to do was to make sure that the evidence was really, really clear. So he's leaning on the CIA, give us the best intel you have. We need to be absolutely certain this was Assad and not some false flag operation. So that's a delaying factor. There's another, which is you do have a UN inspection team in Damascus on the ground at the time of the attack. And they are seen as a problem because they are potentially in the way. They could be collateral damage. They could be used as human shields. They could be held hostage. So by the time all these elements come together, the intelligence, the inspectors on the ground, some time has passed, and now there's starting to be some pushback. It's clear that Congress doesn't really want to support the president on this. It's clear that the allies in Europe don't really want to do this. The British government had signed on to be part of a military strike. They back down. Their parliament shuts it down and says, we don't want to do this. And so there are all these red flags saying, slow down. We don't really want to do this right away. And so Obama makes a decision which seemed rational at the time. Let's, if we're going to do this, let's go to Congress and get Congress to approve. You know, I've been saying all along as a candidate, you know, war and peace shouldn't be just the president's decision. We should do it together as a country. And so he goes on TV and says, yeah, we, we still want to have this punishment for Assad, but we want to have the backing of Congress and we want to do it as a united country. And that's when things fell apart completely because John McCain and a few others favored a strike, but almost no one else did. And so suddenly Obama is, is at this moment where he can't get approval from Congress. So he would have to act all, on his own. And he's, he's stuck. I, uh, Samantha Power in an interview said, you know, her, her quote was, we were naked. We had no options. We had, you know, no ability to enforce the red line. It was a political embarrassment. It was a diplomatic embarrassment. And we were completely stuck until out of the blue comes option Z, which is, a deal with Russia to make Assad get rid of his chemical weapons, which no one had ever really thought about seriously before. Two things that really stood out to me in that in that that chapter, which I just think like they're they're so human. One is I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. There's only really one when they decide that the administration decides we're going to take this to Congress. There is a real sense of confidence, you know. And I think you, I mean. Pardon for paraphrasing, but sort of like, well, you know, Congress never met a war it didn't like, so we're going to get this through. Yeah. And everyone's very bullish on that. And I think is it Susan Rice, who is the one voice that says, I don't think this is going to work. Exactly. Because right? Obama assumed the Democrats would go along. The Republicans right. typically support these kinds of operations. Right. It wasn't an invasion. It was a limited military strike. So it seemed like a no-brainer. The entire cabinet thought this is going to work. We'll get Congress to support it. Then we'll do our military strike. The lone dissent, the one voice that had was right was Susan Rice, the uh, National Security Advisor at the time. Her message was, Congress is never going to give you permission to do this. And she was right, because the con Congress members went back to their home districts. It was summertime, so they were in recess. And, and, and hearing from their constituency, there was no support, no appetite for getting involved in yet another Middle Eastern war, no matter how limited. And I think that's fascinating because it very much presages, I would say, what the appetite is today that we all know, particularly when you see a Republican party that is much less interventionist than it's been in decades today, you really see that in for the, kind of the first time in this Syria decision. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that really struck me uh, was, I recall in the book, and I, I remember watching that it was John Kerry, a reporter asks him, what can they, because he's saying these strikes are likely going to be imminent, and I think it was a reporter at a press conference asking, what could Assad do to not have this happen? And he says, he could give up all of his chemical weapons, every single one of them, the last drop, send it all away. He goes, but he's not about to do that. Yeah. And then he gets, gets off the stage and Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, calls him, right? And says, well, yeah. maybe we can get this done for you. Yeah, it's really amazing because it is, it's an it's a unscripted answer to a reporter's question at a news conference. What can Syria do to get rid of this problem? to avert an airstrike. And it was this hypothetical, well, tell him to get rid of his, his chemical weapons and you know, and, you know, submit to inspections and we'll get rid of all of it. And, and yeah, if he does that, we won't strike. 
no one ever believed that, that Syria would do that. First of all, Syria had never even admitted having chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it would allow people to come in and supervise, supervise the destruction of its chief strategic weapon. This is its counterbalance to, to, to Israeli nuclear weapons. Right. To think that would happen just seemed ludicrous. And so uh, Kerry throws it out there as this kind of pie in the sky idea. And he's on the plane heading back to Washington and this, the, the, uh, the foreign ministry, minister of Russia calls up on the phone while he was on the plane and says, oh, saw your speech, great idea. I think we could make this happen. And so that was the start of what then becomes this historic deal by the Russians, by the United States to unilaterally disarm a country in the middle of a civil war of its most important strategic weapon. And you had this amazing scene um, that will always stick with me in the book. And it is of Kerry and Lavrov, they're in Geneva and they're at a hotel and they're kind of nugging out the last bit of the deal at a table next to the swimming pool. And you describe this guy who's in his swim trunks, who's doing laps and he has no idea what's going on next to him uh, at the pool. Yeah, it's a surreal <laughs> moment. And it was told to me by a couple of people who were there because if you can picture what these meetings are like, you've got dozens of aides kind of crammed into hotel conference rooms, waiting and waiting and waiting for hours as the big boys make their decisions. And finally, when the deal comes together, Carrie and Lavrov go out to a patio table in the swimming pool area to haggle out the last details. And the backdrop to all that, secret service around with their guns and everybody looking a little bit nervous and anxious, is this European guy with a Speedo on, who is completely oblivious to everything, jumps in the pool and he's doing laps while, while the, 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 the diplomats are talking. And it's just this kind of surreal backdrop to what becomes this most consequential of, of, of diplomatic agreements. It sort of shows how spontaneous and, and uh, you know, out of nowhere the whole thing was. Can you to talk a little bit about the logistical challenge that existed in just in getting these, I mean, it's tons of yeah. Syrian and other chemical weapons out of Syria, you know, a country that is, you know, completely wracked by war. Yeah. This was one of the things that, again, drew me to the story because the logistics of this are so complicated that they seemed impossible. And so when this deal comes out of Geneva, we're going to somehow eliminate Syria's chemical weapons program and we're going to do it in nine months. It just seemed, I have to tell you that nobody at the time really thought it was going to work because it was just too hard. We had a really big chemical weapons program in this country. We made a lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And we agreed in the 80s to get rid of it all. It has taken us decades, billions of dollars. We had to build facilities. It's still not finished all these years later. It's never happened in, on a compressed timetable. And you've got a, a, a country that's at war, that has scattered depots all over the country, some of them literally across enemy lines. And so the effort of being able to get all that stuff, make sure you have it all, take it to the coast, because you can't destroy it in Syria. It's going to just take too long get it out somehow, and then what you do with it. There's no plan for how you get rid of 1,300 tons of chemical weapons. There's mm -hmm. no country that says, oh yeah, bring them here, we'll take care of it. Nobody wanted them. And so there were just one logistical hurdle after another that just made this look like a, a problem that was never gonna get solved. We didn't even have a mechanism to dispose of these chemicals, right? So what they call yeah. it the margarita machine is what you write about? So the, a solution comes out of, a, out of nowhere, because you're right, it, it's, it's hard to destroy chemical weapons. Typically, it involves incinerators, which are expensive to build up. They pollute. You know, there's all kinds of problems with those. And so as the Pentagon is casting around for solutions, what could we do if we get them? A guy down in Edgewood, Maryland, this fairly obscure organization that's part of the Army, comes up and says, I can build a machine. And I could do it for a couple million dollars and we could put it on a, in a, in a shipping trailer and move it anywhere in the world. And it's this bizarre looking gadget, looks like tinker toys and pipes and pumps. And people called it the margarita machine because it mixes liquids together and, and creates a less toxic product. And on spec, the army said, okay, build a couple of these. And so he built seven of them. And when the attack happens in 2013 and suddenly we need this technology, we had this thing sitting in a warehouse that we could use. Only problem was there was no country willing to host it. There was no place we could put the machines. I can't take it in Syria or, 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 or Jordan or our neighbor allies. And the only place left was to put it on a boat, which is probably the worst place you want to have chemical weapons sloshing around. We ended up you know, bolting these big machines to the deck of a ship and destroying them at sea. 
It took 40 days, but it actually worked. And so contemporaneous to all of this, you are seeing in Syria now in 2013 and 14, and we're getting into 15, the rise of the Islamic State. And so the Islamic State are non-state actors. So we've gone through all of this rigmarole to get rid of government weapons, government chemical weapons in Syria, but then talk about what the Islamic State are doing at the same time. I mean, granted to a lesser degree, but their interest in chemical weapons. Yeah. So the Islamic State would like nothing more than to, to confiscate, to plunder Assad's stockpile. And they never got around to getting that done. But they did watch and learn from the example of what happened in 2013. You can attract a lot of media attention with the chemical weapons attack. You can kill a lot of people. It's all the things that Islamic State dreams of doing. And so when they weren't able to get Syria's weapons, they came up with the idea of making their own. And so this is a, a fairly little understood fact was that they launched into their own production capability in Iraq and, some, and to some degree in Syria as well, having dedicated facilities with scientists and engineers, all you know, looking at the mission of trying to make chemical weapons for a terrorist group. That's never existed, the possible exception of on Shinrikyo in Japan back in the 80s, but mm -hmm. no one had ever succeeded in building a chemical weapons factory. ISIS did. They didn't get very far. The stuff they made was kind of crude. It didn't work very well, but they were on their way. And the only reason they didn't succeed, according to my reporting, is that the U.S. took this problem very seriously. We spent a lot of resources trying to figure out where their, where their facilities were, and we destroyed them, and we killed or captured their, their chief scientists. A few of them have gotten out, and they, we have to assume they still have the idea or the aspiration, but it was uh, another close call for us in the sense that you know, a terrorist group armed with chemical weapons is a very frightening prospect indeed. You write about the, the Khan Shakun attack in 2017. I thought you could maybe just, as we wrap up here, talk about that, talk about the state of affairs with regards to Syria and the Assad regime, and, you know, and kind of sadly where we're at uh, with respect to chemical weapons there after all of these efforts. After 2014, when the last of the declared stockpile had been removed from Syria, Syria quickly reverts to bad behavior. They don't use sarin anymore. They don't use their really bad stuff, but they use chlorine, which is an industrial product. They use it to clean drinking water. It's a million uses for it. So every country is allowed to have chlorine. And they improvise by using bombs made with chlorine uh, in a few attacks. They don't use sarin again until 2017 after Trump comes into office. And they're hearing language from Trump that seems to suggest that he doesn't want to get involved in Syria. He thinks this is a bad place for Americans to be, seem to be writing it off. And so for that reason or for whatever reason, the, the Syrians start to feel emboldened. And so they use sarin again in a pretty horrific way in, in the spring of 2017. They drop a bomb on a city that's held by the rebels. A number of people are killed. It's, it's another mini version of, of the event that happened in 2013. And it uh, essentially shows that, uh, that the intent never went away. Uh, there was no real accountability for Assad for, for all the things he did, for the chemical weapons attacks and all the other human, uh, human rights atrocities that he's committed over the years. He's never been personally forced to be accountable or, or to pay for his crimes. And because of that, there's no expectation that he's learned a lesson and will not take advantage of other opportunities that he has when he thinks he can get away with it. And that's part of it sad lesson that's learned from all this. Joby, it, it's, it's an amazing book. Uh, congratulations on it. Uh, Redline, if you're watching, uh, pick it up from Left Bank Books. And uh, many thanks to the St. Louis County Library for hosting us. And again, great talking to you, Joby. Great pleasure. Thank you. All right.